Okay, so it is the start of the live stream. I'm just going to talk for a minute about different stuff while people come into the main uh, chat here and while they distribute the link. I wanted to look up the... Um, Uh, classifications, uh, rhyme, and I'll just read that out real quick. If I can find it. Um, well, uh, maybe I won't do that because I didn't prepare it. I only thought to do it in the last few seconds before I started the broadcast, so might not happen. Um, all right, well, um, let's see here. Um, all right, hopefully people will be filed in soon. All right, we got people. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, <clears throat> Hello, um, and, uh, uh, ah, in disguise. I think, I think I know who that is. Um, uh, but, uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. So it's, it's Vic in case. Got it, got it. Um, uh, okay, uh, so, I don't know if anyone else is coming, so we'll just start. Um, all right, um, why have you combined? <laughs> Decent question. Uh, but, uh, let's see here. Uh, Long starts the chapter by leaping most of the way up the side of the building then using his metal claws and super strength to, to climb the rest of the way up. Taylor thinks about trying to flee down the fire ex escape, but realizes that even if she did get... Oh, you know what? I did not put up the image. My bad. Boop. This was supposed to be already on screen. Um, cool. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, Taylor th thinks about uh, trying to flee down the fire escape, but realizes that even if she doesn't get fried before that happens, Lung could just jump to the ground to pursue her. Thinking through things she brought in the armor compartment on her back, she uses pepper spray. After a false start, she gets Lung in the eye that hadn't been hit by the bee and wasp stings. Blinded, Lung is still able to hit her with an undirected wave of flame that he sends over the whole roof. This throws her into the lip of the roof. She has the strength to get up, but doesn't, because he would be able to locate her with his enhanced hearing. It's mentioned that as Lung walks around, he has a limp. This is probably due to the massive amounts of various venoms all competing in his system, starting to overwhelm his healing abilities. Moments before Lung can finish her off, the people Lung, initially, uh, Lung was initially after show up. A big bone lizard tiger thing jumps from the next building over and slams into him. Lung is able to hold his own for a moment, staggering the thing by punching it in the face with his dragon man hands. But this prompts the monster to full charge him off the roof. After Lung, the uh, the animal or after Lung and the animal are fighting. Uh, wait. I must have accidentally deleted something. After Lung and the animal are fighting on uh, the street, two more of the things jump over with capes riding on each. They slide off the backs of what we learn are souped-up dogs. Uh, two young men and two young women are there. As is often the case in Worm, their costumes don't match up as a team theme or similar. Later in the story, one of these very capes will talk about how bad they think it looks when teams do that. Um, okay, taking a moment to read the chat here. Uh, question one, where does Taylor get these EpiPens? Are they not prescription? I don't know. That I guess that is a decent question. 
Um, I feel like, hmm. Yeah, I okay, over the counter. Yeah, that would make sense to me. And even if they're not in the real world, they're over the counter in Worm. There we go. Explained. Um, uh, Gru is the first to speak to Taylor, introducing his team. Gru is basically wearing motorcycle leathers and a skull mask. He's cool as shit. I would totally wear his costume in real life and not feel embarrassed about it. Most people only know the word Gru in reference to the monster that dwells in darkness, found in various fantasy settings. This makes sense because of Gru's power, uh, on the surface level, being to generate darkness, but the meaning of the word itself is a shudder of fear, and it's also the first half of Gruesome. Tattletail has a purple and black bodysuit with a domino mask. Uh, those are the kind that just cover around the eyes. You've seen them in characters like uh, Green Lantern or Black Cat. She's always smiling to herself and projecting confidence. She can uh, get information easily. Her brain is like a supercomputer that pulls in data it shouldn't have. We'll talk about all four characters and their powers more uh, in later chapters, but Tattletale can be seen as something of an exposition cheat. She's able to give an info dump to Taylor and the audience in a way, in an entertaining way. Um. Uh. Unclear, M. I I don't know if EpiPens are free in the Worm World. Uh. But man, she just, she got him. Uh, bitch uh, basically doesn't wear a costume. She just has clothes she normally wears and also a plastic dog mask. She's the one who powered up the dogs that are fighting Lung. She provides the uh, muscle to the team. A lot of the way that different groups operate in this setting is based around what types of bases they can cover in a fight. Aside from Bitch, this team has two utility capes and a thinker. So it really helps them to round out the team to have some actual muscle. Last, we have Regent. We don't learn much about him or get to see his powers yet, but Taylor says he has more of a dancer or more of the build of a dancer than a bodybuilder. He's garishly dressed, which fits his personality, but is also something of a facade, allowing him to su surprise his enemies with uh, hidden weapons and armor. Um, bu -bu -bu. let's see here. Taylor doesn't manage to say anything to them until uh, they're about to leave as she's too nervous to talk. Gru and Tattletail fill the dead air, explaining that they knew Lung was coming and went to wing it uh, and fight him because they couldn't figure out a better plan. Tattletail picks up on a protectorate cape approaching and they start to leave. They offer to give Taylor a ride with them, Gru having assumed she was a new solo villain in Brockton Bay. Tattletail gives her the name Bug, since she doesn't have a cape name yet, and bids her farewell. Um, Taylor sits there, stunned to, to realize that not only had they mistaken her for a villain, but these very teens were the kids that Lung was planning to kill. A rival team of capes. Blah! Um, and then... Uh, I like this chapter because even though it's early on and she gets bailed out, we get to see how dangerous being a solo operator and even just cape fights in general are. Taylor gets to use her resourcefulness and uh, we're able to see that even in the face of what feels like certain death, she never gives up, willing to fight with any meager tools or weapons she has at her disposal. I also think that Pepper Spray being effective in the fight is like an extension of the idea that her bug power can seem underwhelming to people who haven't thought through the possibility space of the power to intelligently control a swarm of bugs. I also like that she wasn't able to suddenly overcome Lung on her own, which would have seemed jarring based on what we had knew from previous chapters. Um... In the chat, they say, I was so worried she would be called Bugs Forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I alluded to on a previous episode, the first time that Taylor sees the dogs, she's horrified by them and finds them entirely monstrous in appearance. But you'll see her opinion on them soften, and later she'll reach the point of normalization that she can't understand the fear of other capes and even civilians. When they're faced down by these... Hulky, spiky, bone lizard tigers. 
Um, M says, good thing she gets named Worm. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that's why they call it Worm. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I love sassy internal monologue, Taylor. Uh, the irony of the fire escape being anything but didn't escape me. Classic line. Um, and then we are on to 1.6. I I did describe them as bone lizard tiger dogs. Uh that that happened. Um bloodied and snarling, some would say. Uh as Tattletail predicted, we open with the hero from the protector arriving. Taylor can hear his motorcycle on the street level, exhausted by her fight and not wanting to look like she's fleeing. She just sits there on the roof waiting for them to reach her. Armsmaster arrives on the scene, leader of the protectorate. We get a few lines telling us about them being the government-sponsored hero teams across Canada and the U.S., trying to form new ties to expand to Mexico as well. As the story goes, we'll find the, that the Protectorate is a corrupt organization in many ways, but somewhat comically, they're much less corrupt than actual U.S. police forces. Most of the actual Protectorate heroes are well-meaning and believe in what they're doing. In real life, it's like, a cab all day, every day. But within the story setting, my feelings are less cut and dry. Um, um, let's see here. And then uh, Armsmaster is a tinker. From this point forward, when I talk about new powers, I'll probably classify them as we go. Taylor is a master. Lung is a changer. Armsmaster probably has a lot of small or subtle gear that isn't mentioned here, but he has a signature halberd which has a lot of capabilities and can deal with a wide range of opponents. He also has his motorcycle, body armor, and visor with built-in lie detector. In real life, lie detectors are basically just fake. Um, but uh, since he's a skilled tinker, his almost certainly works. Uh, his color scheme is blue and silver. There are certain cultural conventions in this setting about color combinations that indicate hero and villain. These aren't strictly followed, but uh, it's part of why he initially assumes that Taylor is a villain. All dark gray, with the only other color to her costume being yellow lenses on her mask. He believes Taylor when she tells him she's a good guy because of the lie detector. Um, yes, and Tinker is the only classification we've uh, heard so far. I am going to talk about more at the end of this uh, uh, set of chapters here. Um, let's see here. Uh, Taylor sort of blurts out that she almost died, and Armsmaster brings up the wards to Taylor letting her know that if she joined, she would have backup and resources that she wouldn't have as a solo hero. But this doesn't interest Taylor, as she sees this as an extension of the kinds of settings and systems she's been trying to escape by being a hero. I'll talk about the wards more as we meet some of those characters later. They're kid-to-teen superheroes, anyone who's not legally an adult. Plus, sometimes they wait a bit longer to have a ward move up to the Protectorate to hide exact ages of the hero in question, to avoid making identities too obvious. They're not actually supposed to go into dangerous situations, and are only supposed to be in training until they're adults. Uh, but we'll quickly find that those lofty I ideals to keep the kids safe have long since been abandoned in favor of practical need for powers on the battlefield. Um, and... Greg brought up Alexandria's costume. Uh, agreed, she has a costume that is uh, all uh, black and gray, I believe. Um, and uh, agreed with uh, with Vic that Tinker is uh, the most different from the other powers, in my opinion, uh, in terms of like actual functionality. Um, uh, let's see here. Taylor tells Armsmaster about the fight. What she tells him gives him new information on how the Undersiders have stayed one step ahead of the authorities up to now. We also get to hear about the Undersiders from Armsmaster, uh, 
Gru and Hellhound were previously solo operators, but he has no information on Tattletail or Regent. Taylor says that the group didn't seem too hardcore. We'll actually see a lot of ways that different groups interact and deal with the stresses of battle over the course of the story. As Taylor laments the fact that they were probably letting their guard down around her because they thought she was a villain, Armsmaster uses the mindset that Taylor had been aspiring to keep and turns a negative into a positive, ta telling Taylor it was actually a good thing the Undersiders thought she was a villain because she wouldn't have been able to beat them in a fight. She admires that trait even though she's worn out and generally not in the mood to deal with people. Although she's somewhat charmed by his smile and laugh, her opinion on him sours when she realizes later in the conversation that he wants to take credit for defeating Lung. There are legitimate reasons that he presents for her not to take credit, uh, but it still bothers her, and she can tell that at least part of his motivation is to increase his own status with the solo capture of such a high-profile villain. I personally think that any flaws Armsmaster has, he's not like a terrible guy, like some people feel. Uh, he has a lot of growing to do, and we'll see him grow throughout the story um, as he's a prominent character in like large portions of the book. Arm Man trying to be a good guy for the first and only time. Yeah, well, uh, he does some good stuff. Um... When talking about reasons not to take credit, he mentions Oni Lee, who can sort of teleport with a twist. He makes a clone in, the, in a new location, and the old him turns to dust several seconds later. I would probably classify him as a mover. Uh, it sort of feels like he would be a master as well, because the twist of his power uh, allows the old selves to keep fighting for a few seconds before disappearing. Taylor mentioned knowing about Oni Lee and vaguely knowing about his power in 1.3, but hasn't heard of Bakuda, who's a newcomer to Brockton Bay. She kicked off her career with a uh, terrorism campaign against Cornell University, where her plots were foiled by the New York Protectorate. Bakuda is a tinker who specializes in bombs. Neither of them are the type of person you want to carry a grudge against you. Um... Okay, so M says, I'm constantly viewing this like Taylor is going to be a villain, so I was thinking her costume design choices may have been subconscious desire to appear more threatening, like a villain. Like, do the heroes all look friendly? A villain? Taylor would never! From the combined account. Mmm, I want it to happen so bad, says M. Uh, and then we can stand Bakuda. It's the last thing that they say. Ugh. Uh, the end of their interaction leaves Taylor with the feeling that Armsmaster owes her a favor. She's probably right based on what he said, but he did sort of leave wiggle room to try and get out of this. Because he never directly said it. Uh, Taylor heads home and changes into a set of clothes he hid earlier on the way there. She's able to take some comfort in the idea that the night could have gone worse to distract herself from the fact she's going to have to go back to school tomorrow. A uh, great Taylor moment from this chapter uh, that I could, couldn't think of anywhere else to put, but wanted to pull out. I was pretty sure that he was obligated to try and induct new heroes into either the Protectorate or the Wards, depending on their age, to promote the whole agenda of organized heroes who are accountable for their actions, and I really didn't want him to get on my case about joining. Oh, Taylor. Um, and yeah, Taylor does think a lot about self-image. That's, that's true. Um, self-image is one of her tools. Um... I like that line, uh, it was like Michael Jordan saying you sucked at basketball. Uh, I think it's pretty funny. Um, and he definitely would tell you that, though, because Michael Jordan, uh, he mean. But, like, you know, not knowing him, it's fun. Uh, um, one of my favorite line readings from the audiobook is Rain reading out the line, You gonna fight me? In his arms master voice. Um, uh, <laughs> M says, me sitting in algebra class 
thinking of the man glued to the sidewalk in a steel cage that I helped capture. Uh, um, I didn't, I didn't think that much about the themes this week. The bullying, like, in a way, Arms Master kind of subtly bullies Taylor. Um, uh, the way that he gets her to let him have credit for, um, Lung's capture. Um... <laughs> yeah, M says that she also likes the, the, we gonna fight or what? <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh no, got a little spam bot. Greg will have to ban them. Um, let's see here. The glossary, all we have in the glossary this time is power classifications. The Protectorate and other associated groups use a power classification system to determine responses and tactics when dealing with hostile parahumans. These classifications can hold a broad array of powers within each one, but can be a helpful way to think of powers. We'll talk about several in the powers knowledge section. Um... Um, uh, oh, you're saying that you think that Arms Master didn't do anything wrong in this chapter? I actually agree. Um, I don't think that Arms Master really did do anything wrong in this chapter, but uh, it still turns a lot of people against him right away, which I kind of find, uh, find kind of really weird. But, um, Oh, M had another question. Is there some place I could read along while we listen? It helps me know. Um, and can I link it in the Discord? Yeah, I'll link it in the Discord. We can uh, get that there. The whole text is online and free. So, um, uh, and that is at... Um, parahumans.wordpress.com um, and I'll link it in the Discord later. Oh, uh, Greg linked it right there. That's very good. Um, let's see here. So, uh, now to the character section. I changed it from the new character section because I'm going to want to keep bringing people up as we learn, uh, important stuff about them later, etc., um, and I want to be able to mention characters we basically don't know, uh, yet also. Um, uh, so, Gru. He seems like a friendly guy for a villain. He's cautious, doesn't like situations like this where they don't have a plan going in. He's got a deeper voice and he's a bit more than six feet tall. He could be mistaken for an adult when in costume, but he's a teen, just like the others. Uh, his costume, he wears a black biker outfit, leather jacket and all, full face helmet with a skull pattern on the visor, usually has a layer of smoky darkness flowing out of him that obscures him. The helmet has vents that allow the darkness to flow out. Um, and then we've got, M, do you have any questions about, uh, Gru? Uh, see, I want to know where Gru got his cool ass mask. I feel like you could just get a skull face helmet in real life now. Um, I believe they're out there. I I don't even think it had to be commissioned. I, I think that this is just a product that exists in the current world. And in the worm world. Um, I mean, helmet with a skull on it. I mean... Yeah. Anyway, uh, Tattletale always seems like she's up to something. She acts casual and jokes on the battlefield, always wants to keep her status as the smartest person in the room. She's thin and has long, dark blonde hair. She's a bit taller than Taylor, and she's my problematic fave. Um, and then M says... Is this what the thing Arms Master was talking about? The Capes Youth Group? The Wormed? <laughs> Sanctuary or something? Wormed? Uh, they're, it's, uh, they're called the Wards. Um, and these, these guys 
that I'm talking about are the undersiders, a group of teen, uh, teen villains. They love crime. They just love it. Um, let's see here. Um, I was shocked at the beginning when like half the villains are teenagers. Yeah. Um, it's a little weird, uh, I guess, but it makes a lot more sense when you like understand the setting, I guess. Um, uh, but yeah. Yes, Undersiders, Teen Villains, and Ward's Teen Heroes, definitely. Okay, so, Tattletail's costume. She wears a skin-tight lavender bodysuit with bands of black across the chest and down the sides of her arms and legs and body. Um, an image of a stylized gray eye is barely visible against the black of her costume. She's got a black domino mask, and the rest of her face is visible. She wears a utility belt diagonally across her body and keeps her hair down. Uh, her powers? She seems to have a power that gives her insight into the world around her. She's not only able to know when trouble is coming, but she also knows what Taylor used to attack Lung. Um, teenagers are inherently evil. Thank you for that, Em. Um, uh, next we've got Bitch. She's very aggressive and wants to fight first and ask questions later. She loves her dogs and spends most of her time trying to care for dogs that would be put down. Seemingly unable to have normal interactions and relationships with people because of her past trauma. She's about as tall as Gru with a burly build, helped by handling and riding her giant dogs. Her costume is just various regular clothes, usually a large jacket with lots of pockets, and a plastic Rottweiler mask. Her power gives her the ability to pump up dogs uh, with, like, essentially a changer form, uh, to become, like, van-sized and composed of bone spikes and calcified muscle. Uh, the dogs are still distinguishable from uh, each other when they're fully powered up. They're not becoming some generic template. Each dog has its own form. Um... Uh, so Regent, he has the, he has a dancer's build with short, curly black hair, openly offensive to his enemies, passive-aggressive to his friends, pleasure-seeking, lazy, easily bored, and always trying to get under people's skin. He loves to make a joke at the wrong time. This guy is Victoria's problematic fave. His costume, he wears a loose-fitting white shirt, a uh, white Venetian-style mask, a silver coronet, and a skin-tight leggings under his, his knee-high boots. He also carries a silver scepter with a crowned orb at the top. Um, M says, I'm having such a hard time visualizing the dogs. Um, error. I'm going to find a good art real quick and then link it in the chat. Um, I think... Well, no, I don't want to use someone's work that we haven't asked beforehand, and we haven't asked anybody except, you know, Vic's drawings. So, uh... Uh... <laughs> um... Let's see here. So... Yeah. At the question, Emily, who's your favorite so far? Uh, I couldn't bring myself to try to draw them. And then M says, not gonna lie, Arms Master sounds like a dad, so he's my favorite. <laughs> You're fine. I can look it up, maybe. Ha! He's a bad dad. And then, um, uh, Greg links something, which I'm sure is a good doge picture. Um, uh, Worm Hellhounds. Um, he sounds like a good dad, says M. Um, uh, arms master, bad dad. Uh, let's see. Oh, and M just saw the dogs and said, holy shit. Um, <laughs> you think he's a tail? <laughs> uh, oh boy. So, uh, moving on from Regent to, in fact, arms master, the leader of the Brockton Bay Protectorate. 
He's in his early 30s. He's been a cape for over 15 years and fought in many important battles. He's very concerned with rising the last few ranks in the Protectorate. His costume? Armsmaster wears dark uh, blue body armor with silver highlights. His emblem is on his chest, a silhouette of his blue visor against a silver background. His helmet covers the top of his head and has a sharp V-shaped opaque visor covering his eyes and nose. His trimmed beard is visible. Um, he carries his trademark halberd and has a bunch of other tinker gear built into his costume. Um, and his powers, he is a tinker of some kind. That is about all we know. We know he made most of his gear, but we don't know what his specialty is or, or whatever. Um, and then M says, oh, the Undersiders, uh, probably Dog Lady. And then, <laughs> cringe, total Dirk move. Um, but, uh, the person who's saying uh, liking the dog lady is is cringe was recently remarking on thinking that uh, bitch is kind of a fan service character in some ways, and I think it's earned fan service. <laughs> but uh, let's see here. Um, M says also yes, it doesn't help. I imagine Doc Ock when he first appeared. <laughs> um. Total Alfred Molina. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, yeah. As far as, like, Arms Master's gear that we know of, it's, like, the armor, the uh, lie detector, the halberd, which has, like, tons of special functions. And, you know, so he's got a pretty, like, I guess, wide net that he can cast as far as, like, technologies he can make. Um, and then we've got Bakuda. We don't know this mysterious bomb tanker yet, but we should be on the lookout. Powers, bomb tanker. Uh, we'll talk about Bakuda more in her real debut. Um, OMG, I'm... I'm going to have to go down a hole of fan art or something. That's a risky risky proposition, M, in some ways. Uh, so, you know, buyer beware on spoilers if you're doing that. <laughs> um, because uh, Victoria ran into a very early, uh, like, massive spoiler. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Powers knowledge and other world building information. Um, we've got master powers. Um, the powers in this classification, uh, masters are a pair of humans that can control other things or create minions that do their bidding. Their personalities, masters arise from isolation, alienation, and betrayal. Feeling isolated from a single individual tends to feed into having a single fixed minion, while feeling isolated from society tends to result in numerous and or variable minions. Um, the master classification will of course be one of the most important in the story since the protagonist is a master and will be seen from her perspective for the majority of it. Um, uh, Taylor, of course, had isolation and alienation from all of her peers because of the intense bullying and the sense of betrayal from uh, from Emma. So it's uh, it's all right there on the page. Um, and then Tinker. The powers that Tinkers have are distinct from other parahumans in that their powers don't work through them so much as they enable them to fabricate things. Most Tinkers have a specialty, an area of technology they work on exclusively or better than others. Some Tinkers draw from real-world technical knowledge, and some rely more on instinct. For personalities, Tinkers arise from problems without solutions that take place over long periods of time. 
accumulating until a crisis moment. The Tinker classification helps explain why characters like Iron Man would exist. In this setting, his devices wouldn't work if he didn't do constant maintenance. Some of the devices only work if you have an intuitive understanding behind the device itself, or other knowledge granted by the power. Um, and we'll see examples of that later in the book of characters who just essentially have also have a thinker power. And M says, okay, well, Arms Master will be Doc Ock in my head for now then. There it is. I can post spoiler-free um, art in the Discord, I think. I think that's that would be fine. Um, uh, but also, Victoria is, her next chapter art is going to be, uh, Arms Master, so that will allow us to, to see. Um, everyone is younger than you'd think. Armed Man is in his early 30s. It's true. It's true. Because he triggered as a teen, like pretty much everybody else. <laughs> like some people trigger as an adult, but uh, not a lot of people. Um, let's see here. Changer. Their powers can alter their form, appearance, or natural abilities through some form of manipulation of their own bodies. Changers don't typically get new powers beyond natural weapons. Lung, for instance, has a small kernel of each of his other powers with no transformation. Um, so he can use a small amount of pyrokinesis. He has natural fast healing. He's naturally a little tougher, a little bigger, and a little stronger than like he was before he had his power. Um, and then let's see here... Oh, and then uh, Vic made a joke. Uh, it's like Harry Potter, because in that, like, everyone who fights is like a teen, and Harry's parents get, like, murderized at 21 and stuff. So they're all, like, way younger than you'd expect. Um, Just a bunch of young wizards running around. That's true, Em. That is, that is how it is. Um... For personalities, changers arise from mental and emotional issues involving identity or body image, or from conflicts involving constraining social expectations. Lung is officially classified as a brute and blaster, his strength and projectile fire respectively. I think this has to do with Wildbo not having fully thought out the connections between powers and personalities when he had written this, like, really early stuff. Um... Maybe it's another reason that I, I just couldn't sort of come up with, but I don't think it's a problem to call Lung a changer and just have him be out of the norm for that grouping. Plus, he does have some weird identity issues that we'll get into later uh, as they come up. So it, it all kind of fits. I don't know. Um, do you want to ask about any of the characters? Um, to be honest, I haven't thought a lot about how classifications have personality archetypes and similar triggers, so it'll be interesting to think about all that. Yeah, yeah, um, they, I feel like they talk about it more in Ward, and they also talked about, in the podcast, We've Got Ward, they talked about, they focused more on that, and so, um, I really, like, thought about it a lot on my rereads of Worm later, um, and it, it kind of adds adds a lot there, too. Um, let's see here. Uh, em, do you have any questions about any of the characters? Um, do, 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 do. Let's see here. It's like astrology. Well, it's like if astrology gave you superpowers. Uh, <laughs> the more I think about it, the more I think Lung has a real uh, weird view of himself and other people. Yeah, yeah, he definitely does. I agree, Vic. Um, uh, like, he has an interlude later, and you just get to see how he like mentally interacts with the world um post 
powers, and it's just like, I don't know, it seems really hollow, I guess. Um, uh, okay, so the person in the background of that drawing is Regent. He is the one who we don't know anything about his powers. Uh, he's a little snarky. Um, uh, and yeah, he didn't really do anything this chapter. Um, uh, he doesn't really do anything he doesn't need to. That's true. Uh, my description of him included uh, that he's very lazy. Um, uh, M says, I like the one that the one who chuckled and he was like, stop. Um, I think you're saying you liked Regent, or maybe you're saying you liked Gru on the other end of that interaction. Not, not quite sure, but... But yeah, from left to right, we have uh, Bitch, Tattletail, uh, Gru, and Regent. And then, theoretically, the dogs in the shadows. Um, okay, well, I guess if there's no more questions... Oh, to be honest, the uh, classifications aren't great at classifying parahumans. It's true. They're meant to prescribe ways for the PRT to take down parahumans, not as a taxonomy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I won't talk about the dogs. There, it can be. That's that's a secret. Um, academics and Worm dropped the ball on coming up with a better non-PRT classification system. Also true. Also true. Um, they kind of just went with what already existed and tried to flesh it out. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, like, they're kind of right about how, like, it works. But, um, you know, they didn't, like, entirely fail at studying parahumans or anything. Um, it's just that, like, it's far beyond their capabilities to delve into the true secrets of the powers. They're all, they're all crazy. Um, all the powers, but uh, let's see here. Um, all right. Well, the reading this week will only be one chapter. One dot X is the last chapter in the arc and the first interlude. Interludes are chapters from the perspective uh, of characters other than Taylor. They let us take a look at things from other angles, and they can let the audience know things that Taylor doesn't know to build up dramatic irony. Uh, it's not as pronounced early on, but many of the interludes have a drastically different tone or point of view from the way the book reads when Taylor is the point of view character. Um, this will be the end of the first arc, so we'll spend some time talking about arc one overall after the chapter discussion next week. And to help me talk about it, uh, Vic is actually going to be joining me for the end of ARC episode. Uh, with all that said, uh, the audience participation for next week is to reflect on ARC 1 as a whole, then talk about the themes and motifs you noticed. If you want, you can message me longer answers, and I'll read them out, and we can talk about them. Um, and I'm going to be posting this in the Discord so that people don't have to just remember it or, like, listen to me or something. <laughs> um, let's see. <laughs> Finally, out of her head. It's stuffy in there. Fun. Ooh. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, a lot of people in the community that have read the book they say about the interludes that sometimes it's nice uh, to have the interlude chapters to break up the amount of time that you're just stuck in Taylor's head because later on her mindset is just so intense all the time. Uh, it's it's pretty funny. Um, and then uh, Vic says, don't worry, I won't drink this time. M says, I mean, it would be funny. Um if you have any suggestions for segments you should let us know absolutely um uh we have sort of an open time slot and we're trying to think of something to fill with it because we want to flesh out the episode and uh you know do do something a little special for the end of arc episode um especially since we only have one chapter um so because i i'm not sure how long the arc review segment will take i still need to write the outline for that so 
Um, and then examples of the stuff is March Madness or character rankings. Uh, or Vic writing a sonnet for Arms Master. Um, let's see here. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Does anybody have anything else they want to say before I kind of cut it off? Give it like uh, 20 to 30 seconds while I reminisce how great Taylor is. She's just amazing. True champion. Um, unstoppable. No one can ever beat her. Um, nope, no more. Okay. Um, I think we are done then. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next week. The uh, audiobook portion will be a little later, probably closer to 12.30 or 12.35, because we're only listening to one chapter. And then we will, uh, and that's in mountain time, so that'd be 11.30 or 11.35 Pacific. And then the episode will air just like every week at uh, 1 p.m. Mountain and noon Pacific. Um, and yeah.